Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a blessing for us to be together here again this morning. A couple of announcements, reminders before we begin our service together. Uh, two invitations for you. First of all, we invite you immediately following our evening service tonight to make your way forward to the steps here in the first rows of pews as, uh, as we spend some time together in prayer. It is the 22nd day of the month. And that's the day we gather uh, for prayer for our church, for our community, uh, for our country. And so we invite you to that. And then, of course, it is Thanksgiving Sunday, or Thanksgiving week. And on Thursday, we have our Thanksgiving service planned for 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, uh, please read the emails that you received and the bulletin announcements carefully and follow those directions if you would. Uh, but we look forward to a, a wonderful service of thanksgiving and celebration as we gather together in the word and in song um, to honor all of the distancing and so forth. Um, after about a hundred or so people, we have everything set up downstairs for the overflow to be able to worship together downstairs as the service will be live streamed downstairs as well. So, brothers and sisters, uh, would you please stand as together we sing to the King of Kings, crown him with many... This familiar psalm calls us into worship this morning responsibly with these words. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. The King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors. That the King of glory who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory.
brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Uh, next week Sunday, Lord willing, we are going to gather together on that first Sunday of Advent. Can you believe this? And we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And so our prayer this morning, our prayer of confession, will also be a prayer of preparation for our time together at the Lord's table. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Oh, gracious God and Father, King of kings, King of all ages, we profess with our mouths and we, we sing our songs, exalting you as our sovereign Lord. And yet, Lord, this morning, we acknowledge that Again, as we gather together in your spirit, searches our hearts. You remind us, Lord, you convict us that, that we don't always live as if you are the rule in our life. We don't always thank you for the gracious, generous, benevolent king that you are. We don't always obey you as the one who alone is worthy of our obedience and our praise. Lord, it's easy in these days, these strange times for us to put our trust in horses and chariots and political leaders and constitutions and religious uh, systems and structures and, and, and traditions. Forgive us, Lord, for placing our hope and our trust in anything or anyone but you. So, Father, as we prepare to gather again a week from today to be reminded, to be renewed, to be refreshed by the assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, including this sin of idolatry, misplaced trust, we ask, Lord, in the days leading up to it that you by your spirit would search our hearts and see if there be any wicked, offensive way in us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that where there is offense, where there is brokenness in our relationships, whether it be with friend or family or acquaintances, we pray, Heavenly Father, that in obedience to your word and as an expression of our great gratitude for the forgiveness that we have received in you that we would forgive as you have forgiven us that we would make the initiative make the effort to restore as far as it depends upon us those broken relationships and ask Lord that as we come before you in these things that again you would refresh us with the assurance of that forgiveness and renew in this week again as we come to the table our commitment to love and to serve you. Not in order to receive your grace and your favor and your mercy and your blessing. But no, to love and to serve you because in response to, compelled by your love which has been displayed to us in your son Jesus Christ. And so Father, we pray all of these things confessing them to you in the confidence of our identity in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So then, brothers and sisters, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace always to help us in our time of need.
Amen. I want to spend some time in prayer again uh, together this morning and just want to highlight a number of things. Um, so we have been privileged to partner with Aaron DeBoer in beginning to plant a church up in the foothills, up in the Maple Falls area. Well, the last two weeks, Aaron has begun this effort in earnest and intentionally by, by inviting a group of people to gather together on Thursday nights for a Bible study, uh, for singing, for prayer and worship and fellowship. And the first week, uh, Aaron gathered with 10 people, a mixture of believers and unbelievers alike. And we were just thrilled, wonderful. Uh, last week, Thursday, Aaron had lost two of those 10, but gained nine. And so he was at 18, 17 or 18 people. Uh, again, believers and unbelievers alike, uh, professionals and, and blue collar workers, just a wonderfully diverse mix of people who have gathered now together for, for worship and the word. And uh, so continue to give thanks to God for this and to praise the Lord for what he's doing there. And, and uh, God is really up to something good. And then um, I want you to remember as well in particular, um, uh, Mitch and Rochelle Senti, um, they've asked for our prayers because uh, it's been a rough go in terms of Envision Ministry and the Summit House on Valencia Street. Uh, some really difficult circumstances and they're kind of feeling the burden of their ministry. Very grateful for our brother and new member, Miles Davis, who has joined that team as an employee now uh, on the staff of Envision. Um, but, but join us this morning and throughout this week praying for them. And then if you would, this is a big week for the DeBerrys because uh, Lee goes in to the UW this week for his uh, open heart surgery. And so we wanna pray for the DeBerrys as well, okay? Let me lead us in a prayer this morning. Uh, I may or may not mention all of these names in addition to the ones mentioned into the bulletin, uh, but, uh, but they are included in these prayers and that list is for you to take home and, and, and intercede on their behalf as well. Would you join me in prayer? A prayer, Psalm 146. We praise you, Lord. Our soul praises you, O Lord. We will sing your praises as long as we live. We won't put our trust in our government or influential people. For when they die, their influence and power are gone. Kingdoms may rise and fall, but the word of the Lord, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, is eternal at last forever. We're blessed, Lord. Oh my, are we blessed because we hope and trust in you. Oh God, who created the world and everything in it, you were faithful to our spiritual fathers, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. And you remain unchanging and faithful to us in this century, all these many years later. And, and will remain faithful until the very end of the age. You uphold those of us, Lord, who are weighed down with the cares of this world. You feed those who are hungry with the bread of life. You set prisoners free with the assurance that their sins are forgiven. And you're in control, orchestrating carefully, purposefully, intentionally all the details of our lives. You give sight of understanding to those who are blind in their sin. And you lift up those who are bowed down. You love those, Lord, who are your own, your children. And so we bring before you, Lord, all those in our body who have been mentioned in our bulletin. Praising you, dear God, for evidence of your Holy Spirit's advance and workings far beyond we could have hoped or imagined at such an early phase of our church planting effort. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for healing, physical healing in the lives of those who have experienced surgeries and are now undergoing the difficult journey of rehab. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for your assurance that you go well ahead of the DeBerrys and you will continue to sustain and uphold and rescue Mitch and Rochelle in their ministry to the marginalized and the hopeless. And we pray your special blessing upon our brother, Miles, as he supports and joins that ministry. Lord, you 
you are a compassionate and gracious God. You watch over us, resident aliens in this sinful world. You're a father to the orphaned, a, a comforter to the widowed. You won't allow, ultimately, the plans of the wicked to flourish and, and come to completion. You just won't. You will reign forever and for all generations because you are our everlasting King. And today and always, we will praise you, Lord. And all God's people say, Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to ask that you turn with me again into your Bibles. Go to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 18, where we continue our study of, of Jesus' arrest and coming now before Pilate. We're going to read verses 28 through the end of that chapter, verse 28 through the end. John chapter 18. Verse 28, Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the place of the Roman governor. That's Pilate. And by now it was early morning, so Jesus had been up all night. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. And Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. We have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words of Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And Jesus said, Well, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are king then. You are king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this very reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis of a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, No, not him! Give us Barabbas! Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Yes. Thanks be to God. Currently on planet Earth, there are, I believe, if my research serves me correctly, 195 countries. 195 sovereign states. Sovereign kingdoms, each with their own rules that govern and customs that define and distinguish one state from another. We see this really clear. In fact, I was reminded of it again yesterday. Yesterday, uh, I visited my mom, who dad lives in Canada, and because the border is closed, we've been meeting at the border ditch the ditch that runs parallel between Zero Avenue and Boundary Road. And there we sit, Mom on one side of the ditch and Ben on the other side. And you know what I, uh, occurred to me? It occurred to me that, that just one little ditch separates two very different countries. How is that possible? I mean, on that side of the ditch, children learn French. Parlez-vous français? When they're in grade school, on this side, they learn Spanish. Uh, on that side of the ditch, they spell differently. On that side of the ditch, they spell color, C-O-L-O-R. 
C-E-N-T-R-E, and center, C-E-N-T-R-E, not on this side. On our side of the line would say, well, you, you've spelled that wrong. X, one minus one, that's not how you spell it. Uh, on that side of the line, they're as crazy about hockey as, as people are about football on this side of the line. And you say to yourself, how can a little ditch make such a big difference? Well, the difference, of course, is, is that that ditch represents the dividing line between two separate countries, two separate kingdoms. In this text this morning, John teaches us through the words of Jesus that there are spiritually only two kingdoms. Not 195, two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God, Jesus' kingdom. Uh, the kingdom of this world is, is ruled by what John three times in the Gospels, in his Gospel, chapter 12, 14, and 16, refers to as the prince of this world. But Jesus' kingdom is, of course, ruled and reigned by, by King Jesus. And these, these two kingdoms are very different. There's very w different ways of, of doing life, uh, ways of thinking, uh, different loyalties. And, and that's what this text, I think, presents to us today. This text, this part of Jesus' story, is a story of contrasts between Jesus' kingdom and the kingdom of this world, which is represented by Pilate. In Jesus' words, in verses 36 and 37, identify what I'm going to pull out of today are three distinctive characteristics of, of the kingdom of Jesus. And then we're going to go from those two verses, in verses 36 and 37, and we're going to look at the contrast which is presented to us in the life and rule and reign of Pilate in the verses that proceed and follow. And as we go through these verses... I want to encourage you, as I have been doing myself all this week and will do yet again this morning, to ask two questions. And these two questions are very simple. First question, as we consider God's word here this morning, of which kingdom are you? The kingdom of Jesus or the kingdom of this world? Of which kingdom are you? Question number one. Question number two, is it obvious? Is it obvious? Look at Jesus' words in verses 36 and 37. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to present, prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Here's the first distinguishing characteristic of Jesus' kingdom. Jesus' kingdom transcends the kingdom of this world. Jesus' kingdom transcends all the countries, the rules, the reigns, the systems of government, the customs and traditions of every earthly kingdom. Verse 36, Jesus says to Pilate flat out, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, Jesus says, my kingdom isn't like earthly kingdoms. The authority of my kingdom comes from heaven, not like yours, Pilate, that comes from Rome. My kingdom is eternal kingdom, not like your kingdom, Pilate, which is going to come and go like every kingdom that preceded you and every kingdom that will follow you. Yours is a temporary kingdom. The first thing that Jesus says about his kingdom is that his kingdom is not of this world. It transcends all earthly kingdoms. No matter how patriotic you are, how much you love your country, how much you're willing to sacrifice for your country, Jesus says, no, 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 no. Wonderful gifts to live in a free country. But, but in my kingdom, your allegiance should be first to me and then only to your earthly kingdom. R.C. Sproul tells of a time that I think illustrates this truth very beautifully. 
He writes of a time in 1990 when he was invited to speak at a lecture in Romania. And, uh, and when they were passing from Hungary into Romania, people had warned uh, Pastor Sproul and his wife Vesta that uh, they should be prepared because they're not real keen on Americans there and uh, they're likely to get hassled pretty seriously at the border. Um, they, they might even get arrested because they're Americans and they're very suspect of Americans. And sure enough, when, when they passed from Hungary into Romania on their rickety train, they got to the border and the Romanian guards came to them and pointed to their passports and then to the luggage and motion for the luggage to be taken down and to be opened up. And, and Sproul says they, they were rough and they were rude. They, were, they weren't trying to win the Warm Fuzzy Award. And then, and then the boss came over, big burly officer who, who spoke with broken English. And, and he noticed one of the ladies in Sproul's team had a, a paper bag on her lap with a little something sticking out and the boss pointed to that little thing and she said, he said, let me see, let me see. And he opened it up and pulled out a Bible. And Sproul says, uh-oh, I knew we were going to be in trouble then. The man took the Bible and started flipping through the pages and he put his finger on there and he looked at Sproul and said, you know American. And he looked at at his wife Vesta and said, you know American. And then he, he said the same thing to the others in the group. And then he smiled and said, and I'm not Romanian. And R.C. Sproul and his wife and the team were confused and then what, what, what is going on here? And he took the Bible and he gave it to R.C. and Vestal. And it was open to Philippians chapter three, verse 20. The guard was a Christian. Look, he said, read. Look, he said, read. And R.C. Sproul read these world, words. Our citizenship is in heaven. The guard was a believer. And he pointed to his subordinates and he said, you leave these people alone. They're okay. They're Christians. R.C. was very grateful, as you can well imagine. This man on the Romanian border, understood something about the kingdom of God and its transcendence above and beyond all earthly kingdoms and rules and customs and traditions. This man understood something that we need to understand, and that is that the Christian flag always flies higher than the American flag, yes? There are only two kingdoms in this world, says Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus and the kingdom of this world. And I ask you this morning, beloved, of which kingdom are you? Secondly, we look at Jesus' words and we read that Jesus' kingdom not only transcends earthly kingdoms, but we also read in Jesus' words that Jesus' kingdom is ruled by humble submission, not the sword. Jesus' kingdom is ruled, is governed by, by humble submission, not by, by the power and the threat of a sword. Verse 37, Jesus says, you're asking me if I'm a king. I'm telling you I am a king, but I'm telling you that my kingdom is not of this world. And the real obvious evidence that my kingdom ain't nothing like your kingdom is by the way my servants, my disciples responded. Wow, yes, there was this little incident with Peter who whipped out his sword, but we corrected that quickly, didn't we, Pilate? He says, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews if my kingdom was this, of this world, but now my kingdom is from another place. See, the kingdom of this world is governed by exerting power. The kingdoms of this world uh, get their way and get things done by a show of, of force, by displays of, of strength. You know the saying, might is right. That's how the kingdoms of, of this world govern. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. That is to say, it doesn't operate, it doesn't move, it doesn't exert power and authority in the same way. Otherwise, my soldiers would have certainly put up a fight 
and I wouldn't have gone down so easily. That's how the, the kingdoms of this world would have responded. They would have resisted. They would have bore arms. In fact, they came with a battalion up to a thousand people to take one lonely, besheveled Nazarene named Jesus. And Pilate, in our story, represents the ways and the customs and the, and the, the way of the kingdom of this world. The Jewish philosopher, Philo of Alexandria, uh, about 20 years after this was written, wrote about Pilate's reputation as one of briberies and insults, robberies, outrages and wanton injuries, executions without trial, constantly repeated, ceaselessly and supremely grievous cruelty. That's how people in the day of Pilate viewed Pilate. They feared him because he exerted physical strength and power, violence. Josephus, a Jewish historian, so perhaps it's a little biased, but other historians confirm and valid corroborate this, tells of a time when, when Pilate uh, decided as the governor appointed by Rome in Jerusalem to ensure that the Roman people behaved themselves and didn't raise up an insurrection and rebellion, there was a time that Josephus writes that Pilate took money from the temple treasury in order to build a 70-mile aqueduct. Well, of course, this didn't go over well with the Jews. That money was not meant for Rome. That money was meant for the temple services. That money was meant for the Lord. And so, so the Jewish mobs began to form, and they began to protest. And so the story is, history tells us that what Pilate did to quell that potential rebellion was he, he planted plain-clothed soldiers in the middle, in the mix of the mobsters with orders not to use their swords, but at the signal of Pilate to take out their clubs that they had concealed in their cloaks and start beating the Jews. And history records that large numbers of Jews died on that day. Some of the blows which they received were the last blows that took their life. And many of them actually were trodden underfoot as the Jewish population and the mobs tried to get away from the Roman soldiers. This was how Pilate ruled. And in our text, Pilate represents the ways of the kingdom of this world. And in contrast to that, brothers and sisters, here you have Jesus, who is more powerful than Pilate and the empire of Rome, but yet he, his method of exerting power is the cross, not a club. The way and method that he exerted his power was through sacrifice and submission, not the sword. In Jesus' kingdom, God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chooses the lowly things of the world, the despised things of the world, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Those words come from the spirit, the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul. It's no wonder when, when Jesus who had now been up all night, was clearly tired in his human nature, was likely disheveled as he was already roughly taken into custody, no doubt had bruises on his face, maybe blood from the blows he had already received from the high priest servant, servant that we read last week. It's no wonder when Jesus in all of his human weakness, stood before Pilate in all of his earthly power and might, that Pilate had just a little bit of a hard time seeing the threat. Are you? Seriously? Give me a break. Are you the king of the Jews? Is this what they're concerned about? No wonder that Christ crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews and absolute foolishness to a Gentile like Pilate. Really? This? 
crucified king? There are only two kingdoms. The kingdom of Jesus and the kingdom of this world. Of which kingdom are we, brothers and sisters? Thirdly, first, the kingdom of Jesus transcends all earthly kingdoms. Secondly, Jesus' kingdom is ruled by humble submission, not a sword. His power ex is exerted. His power is, is swayed, moves in his kingdom through humble submission. And thirdly, in Jesus' kingdom, truth is absolute, not relative. Again, verse 37, look at what Jesus says. You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this reason I came into the world to testify to truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. In Jesus' kingdom, Jesus determines truth. Remember earlier, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus defines truth, and his word is the source of truth. We see this earlier on in our text. When the Jews brought Jesus before Pilate, Pilate was irritated by the fact that early in the morning, the Jews would bother him with this, this simple Nazarene who posed no evident threat to anything of Rome's power. He says in verse 32, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Like, what does this have to do with me? I, I do the bidding of Rome, and clearly this man is no threat to Rome. But the Jews said, we have no right to execute anyone. And then notice what it says. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. What would have happened if the Jews had taken it upon themselves to execute Jesus? How was it that Jesus likely would have died? Probably with a pile of stones on his head. That's how Jews executed criminals. It, it was needful. It was necessary. It had to be that Jesus was handed over to the Roman authorities, to Pilate, because Romans executed criminals by way of crucifixion. And it had to be death by crucifixion because the word of the Lord, first in the Old Testament, Psalm 22, and then reiterated by Jesus in Matthew 20, verse 18, said, I am going to be handed over to the Gentiles who are going to mock me, they're going to flog me, and they're going to crucify me. That's what the word says through David in the Psalms. That's what's going to happen. The Word of God was the guiding principle of Jesus' life. Nothing happens in the kingdom of Jesus apart from the will and the rule of the Word of the King. In Jesus' kingdom, the Word guides how we live. How different that is from how we define truth in the kingdom of this world, huh? In the kingdom of this world, truth is not absolute, determined by our best understanding of the word of God. Truth is determined by what we want truth to be. Truth is determined by what works, pragmatism, by what is expedient, what gets done, what we need to get done. Truth is what makes you feel better and stronger and more confident. Truth is, is if it feels good, you know the old saying, do it. Truth in the kingdom of this world is, is relative. It all, it all kind of depends. Your truth, my truth may be different. And, and my truth may be different today than it was yesterday. It all depends on the circumstances. Well, we sure see this in, in, in Pilate. Pilate was a, a crooked politician, if there ever was one. Pilate was a relativist. He was an opportunist. For Pilate, the ends justified the means. Truth was determined by whatever served his purposes and protected his interests. See, you need to know that Pilate really despised the Jews. 
History tells us that Pilate rarely ever entered into Judea and certainly not into the city of Jerusalem. He was there this week because it was Passover and there were hundreds of thousands of Jews coming from around the world to celebrate the Passover. And his job as an employee of the Roman Empire, the prefect, the governor, was to keep the peace. He couldn't afford unrest or a mob or an insurrection in Jerusalem. So that's why he's here. But he really hated the Jews. He was quite bothered, as we said, by the fact that the Jews came to him with Jesus. He couldn't care less about the Jews. And you can kind of hear a bit of that attitude in the dialogue of the text, right? Go back to uh, uh, verse uh, 29. So Pilate came out to them and asked, "Ah, what, what, what charges are you bringing against this man? And then the Jews hear their, hear their snarky response. Hey, if he weren't a criminal, we wouldn't be bringing him to you, would we? Come on, do your job. Pilate says, well, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Well, he says, well, we have no right, say the Jews, to execute anyone. You, you, hear, you hear the attitude in this dialogue? As far as Pilate was concerned, the only reason that Jesus would have any concern of his was if Jesus posed a threat to his good position in the Roman Empire. And if Jesus was going to cause a mob rebellion, why, he'll do whatever he has to do in order to take care of that problem. What charges are you bringing against this man? And I wonder if if all of a sudden Pilate remembered what had happened not too long ago. I wonder if he was talking with the Jews and heard that attitude come through in that conversation he had with them from the palace porch regarding Jesus, if he remembered what a real pain these Jews could be once they put their minds to something. History tells us that under the cover of night, Pilate had had brought in and set up what they called standards, which were like busts and pictures of Caesar into the city of Jerusalem. And of course, when the Jews woke up the next morning and saw all of these images of Caesar, they were incensed because what does the second commandment say? You shall not make any graven images. And so angry, upset, once again, the Jews began to form a huge crowd and they went and camped out on the front lawns of of Pilate's palace. And they just stayed there, says history, for five days and five nights. They didn't move. Pilate was getting a little sick of these Jews on his yard. And so he said, you know what? Why don't you all come with me to the arena and we'll have a conversation about this. Let's work this out reasonably. And so the Jews thought, perfect, great. So they all went to the Colosseum, to the arena, pardon me. And and once they all got in there, Pilate brought out his Roman guards. History tells us he surrounded the the, uh, Jewish mob by soldiers three men deep. And Pilate said to the Jews, either you accept these standards or I'm going to command my soldiers to slay you. And you know what the Jews did? History shows us that they all went like this and they extended their necks and they yelled, we would rather die at your sword than profane the law of God. And at seeing that, Pilate caved. The Jews had won that show. I wonder, I wonder if that's what went through Pilate's mind when these Jews again were saying, do this, do this. And he heard the attitude in the conversation. They were serious about this. And even though, even though Pilate understood that there was no fault in Jesus, he recognized that there's a problem here that could impact and affect him negatively. And this is why Jesus asked the question, hey, is this your own idea? Did you come up with this on your own? Or are you asking me the question, am I a king, based on what the Jews have told you? Because if it's the Jews, then what you're really asking Pilate is, am I claiming to be the Messiah? But if it's you that are asking this question, well then what you're asking is, is are you going to cause trouble for me by committing treason and claiming that you're a king? Because that could be a problem. That could be a real issue for me. That's going to cramp my style. And Pilate makes really clear what his real concern is, that his real concern is his own power, his own prestige, his own position in Rome. 
when he says, am I a Jew? Like, do I really care about whether you're the Messiah or not? The one who the prophets have? I don't even know much about that. What I really care about is, is are you going to cause trouble for me as an employee of Rome? 35. Huh. What is truth? What is truth? Truth, according to Pilate, was whatever worked, whatever was expedient, whatever made sense at the time, whatever protected your interest. And he'd be willing to do whatever it took in order to do that, even hand over a man who he claimed to be innocent, without fault, to his death. But notice how sneaky he is to try to relieve himself of any blame to wash his hands completely. He knew for his own interest he had to get rid of Jesus and answer the call for crucifixion of Jesus. But he knew that if he handed over an innocent man, that might impact his role and rule in, in Rome. So how was he going to get out of this? Listen to the Jews and at the same time keep his hands clean. He says, I know what I'll do. This is true. This is what works. Who do you want me to release to you? You know, there is this custom that I will release a prisoner to you on the day of Passover. Do you know that in history we really have no record that that ever happened? It's almost like Pilate made this up. Well, you know, you know the custom, don't you? You, you? you know what we do on the day of Passover and during major celebrations. We, we, we give you over a prisoner. Uh, shall I give to you the king of the Jews? No! Give us Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! And very cunningly, Pilate could now wash his hands and say, well, they chose Barabbas instead of the king of the Jews. It's not me, Rome. It's not me, either. They did it. In the kingdom of the world, truth is whatever you make it. And in that kingdom, you can justify evil as good and call good evil. I don't know if this is helpful to you, but I've always kept this. I read this probably 20 years ago. It was a prayer that Reverend Joe Wright, a senior pastor of a large church in Wichita, wrote when he was invited to deliver the opening prayer at a session of the Kansas House of Representatives, National Prayer Gathering in Kansas. And this is what he prayed. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your words, woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we've done. We've lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values, and we confess that, Lord. We've ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it pluralism. We've worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We've exploited the poor and, and called it lottery. We've killed our unborn and, and called it choice. We've rejected to, or neglected to discipline our children and, and called it building self-esteem. We've abused power and call it fair game in politics. We've coveted our neighbor's possessions and, and called it good old ambition. And we've polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it mere freedom of expression. Ha! <laughs> What is truth? There are only two kingdoms, brothers and sisters, the kingdom of this world and Jesus' kingdom. Of which kingdom of, are you? You say, well, I'm pretty sure I'm part of Jesus' kingdom uh, because I'm here this morning, ain't I? I'm, I'm going to put money in the box in the lobby before I leave. My thank you note in the basket. Plan on being here Thursday, middle of the week. I mean, who does that but a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus? In fact, I've already bought my Costco-sized pack of toilet paper to give to New Way Ministry on Thursday. Of what kingdom of... Of course I'm a, kingdom of, a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus. When you read this text, beware, because John offers a sobering warning. And it is this. It is possible to honor God with our lips while all the while our hearts are far from Him. Go back now to verse 28 and 29. 
The Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas. The Jews, the most religious people in the community, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover, so Pilate came out to them. Do you see the height of hypocrisy here? They are seeking Pilate's attention, seeking Pilate's audience to be given permission to kill the Son of God. All the while, they are doing their very best to observe the laws of God and not wanting to be unclean so that they would not be able to take the Passover feast for the remaining days of the seven-day-long feast. Do you see how their hearts were far from the Lord? They despised and crucified Christ in their hearts even while they were desperately trying on the outside to follow all of the rules and regulations. Jesus says an outward show of religious observance without the inward transformation of new life that can only come from me is like slapping lipstick on a pig. All the lipstick of religious display on the outside is powerless to transform a sinful heart on the inside. You cannot be a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus with a sinful, corrupted heart. That's what Jesus' message to Nicodemus was all about. Nicodemus was one of these leaders and said, what do I got to do to be saved? What do I got to do? Remember what Jesus said? I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. John chapter 3, verse 3. He says it again, verse 5. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. To be a citizen of King Jesus' kingdom, a kingdom that is not of this world, you need to be born from above. And how is it that we are born from above? We are born from above by believing that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the King, by confessing with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord, believing that He is the Son of God who gave His life to transform our lives from the inside out. If I want to become an American citizen, I've got to take a citizenship test and pay all kinds of money to make that happen. To become a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus, Jesus took the test and was found righteous, yet suffered the consequence for our sin. And he paid the price, the ultimate price of his life on the cross. Of which kingdom are you? Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord? And then let me close with this. Is it obvious that you are? I don't know if you knew this or not, but I'm actually still a, a citizen of the Kingdom of Canada. I'm here on a green card. I'm a resident alien. Alien, can you believe that? Most people don't find that hard to believe. But I wonder if you can tell, those of you who didn't know that. See, I don't say A anymore. Used to, all the time, A. I, I don't spell center, R-E. I spell it like y'all, E-R. I, uh, haven't watched three full periods of an NHL hockey game in probably 20 years. And I suppose, uh, I suppose the fact that, that even though I'm still a Canadian citizen and that I've blended unnoticeably so into American culture and its customs and ways of talking and spelling and what have you, I suppose that, that my mom and dad maybe are a little bit saddened by the fact they can't tell I'm, I'm a Canadian anymore. If you've been transformed on the inside, brothers and sisters, can a watching world tell on the outside? If you, by the work of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, who exerted his power through his humble sacrifice on the cross, power enough to change a sick, sin soul into a one fit for glory on a cross, if that has happened to you and you have become a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus, is it, is it obvious on the outside? Ben, is it obvious to the people of Second Church and the population of Linden 
and to those who watch what I do online? Is it obvious by the banker who sees my bank statement and knows where the money that God has entrusted to me goes? Is it obvious that I truly am a citizen of the Jesus kingdom? Oh God, may your kingdom come and your will be done. And may it start with me. May it start right here. Amen. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your grace, for your mercy, for the wonder-working power of your sacrificial yielded blood that was spilled. For that power which is powerful enough, Lord, to transform us from death to life, from darkness to light, from citizens enslaved to the prince of this world, to citizens who are free to love and to serve the king of the kingdom of God. We pray, Lord, for those who are not certain of which kingdom or to which kingdom they belong, that today would be the day they respond to the word of God and that all of us would give clear evidence as we work out that salvation freely given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, may it be clearly obvious that we're citizens of your kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. We thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, would you please stand with me, with us, I should say, and let's sing together the first verse of God be with you till we meet again. Brothers and sisters, I pray that the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom so that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called as citizens of his kingdom. Go in the humble, surrendered power of King Jesus who was seated at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, to rule not only in this age, but in the age to come. Amen. Mm -hmm.